On February the 7th in 1949, at the tender age of 15, I commenced a five-year apprenticeship at Fielding and Platt. The first six months were spent in a training school, known then as the Craft Selection School. The senior instructor was Mr. Bert Ravenhill, and the junior instructor was a senior apprentice named Alan Orsop. The apprentice supervisor was a Mr. Fairbrother. An apprentice intake took place every six months, each intake numbering about nine or ten lads. The school was not large, but housed a tool and cutter grinder, a milling machine, a centre lathe, a capstan lathe, a drilling machine and a shaping machine. A long bench was in place to which were fitted six vices, a small office and another small room to house measuring equipment completed the layout. We alternated between bench work and machine work, changing every two weeks. The first bench exercise with the infamous block, a piece of steel two inches cubed, had to be reduced to one and three quarters cubed by chiseling, filing and scraping. Frequent visits to see Nurse Ashwin in the first aid room were made to have treatment on bruised knuckles. Marks were awarded by Bert for the accuracy of the finished block. In turn, we worked on all the machines, firstly performing simple exercises, then making items for the tools we would subsequently make and occasionally producing small components for the factory. Bench work became more interesting after the block was completed. This picture shows the items we each made. They were a scribing block, toolmaker's clamps, a heightened copper mallet, tap wrenches and various calipers. Across at the other end of the factory was an upstairs room used for lecturing purposes and end of year apprentice prize giving. Lectures were given weekly on all facets of workshop practice. Learning to use the various measuring devices such as micrometers and verniers proved quite difficult to, for some of us. We also had lectures on first aid because safety was of prime importance. We were occasionally taken on a tour of the works, primarily to prepare us for the next years of our apprenticeship, and secondly, to help us find our way about. It was quite easy to get lost in those early days. I spent six months in the light machine shop, six months in number two hydraulic shop, six months in the heavy machine shop on a planing machine. And after that, I returned to the light machine shop working mainly on centre lays. I thought I would complete my apprenticeship there, but for the final six months, I was, as a senior apprentice, selected to become the junior instructor in the craft school, as Alan Alsop had been when I was trained there. So, after four years, I was back where I started, but this time helping others during the first months of their apprenticeship. The format of the training hadn't changed, so I soon settled into my new role. It was very rewarding to see the progress the lads made as the weeks went by, knowing that I was partly responsible for making that progress possible. When I left to commence national service in 1954, I was presented with a travel hodol, which proved extremely useful during my two years with the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. After being demobbed in April 1956, I returned to FNP. As the law demanded, I was able to take up the position I advocated to join the army, much to the dismay of the existing instructor. Much had changed in the two years I'd been away. Firstly, the apprentice training department, as it was now called, was situated on the top floor of the factory above the heavy and light machine shops. It was much larger than the previous site and had an adjoining lecture room. As a result, the intake of apprentices would increase in size to about 20, but only occurred once a year. That meant time spent in the school was much longer, up to 11 months. Mr. Ravener was still the senior instructor, but Howard Shenton was the apprentice supervisor and Jeff Morton the personnel manager. The larger area permitted a much more pleasing layout. White lines were painted on the floor to indicate safe walking areas, which had to be kept clear at all times. There were about 10 or 12 bench positions, three centre lays, five capstan lays, a shaping machine and a milling machine. There was also a marking off table on which items were placed to mark out where machining was to take place. An instructor's office, a store for measuring equipment and a toilet and washroom completed the layout. At the end of each day the machines were cleaned and the floor swept as in the original school.
The longer a period of time in the school permitted a much more comprehensive training schedule. Longer times on the various machines enabled greater skills to be achieved, but a lot more time was spent in the lecture room. Bert Ravenel and myself were able to cover a greater range of workshop practices. Each apprentice's progress was carefully monitored. Written tests were undertaken from time to time and marks awarded. Discipline was strict but fair. I can remember most of the 1956 intake, pictured here. It gave me great pleasure to help train these lads for life in the field of engineering. I continued as a junior apprentice instructor until mid-1957 when I left to join Fielding and Platt's drawing office.